Before we go too far, it will be good to convince yourself of the following things. Uh, I've started with the definition of average velocity and the definition of average acceleration. I've rearranged those a little bit to get the following equations. This is the way that you'll see them most of the time in physics books. Uh, shouldn't take too much to convince yourself of that. This one here, for constant acceleration only, it would make sense to us that we can find the average velocity by just merely taking the average of the initial and the final velocity. So adding them up and dividing by two, as you would take to find the average of two things. Um, we can look at a graph of velocity versus time, and we can convince ourselves of the same things, and we can see uh, some very useful results here. So let's take a look. If we have velocity plotted as a function of time, well, first of all, let's convince ourselves of this formula right here. We have a straight line on our velocity versus time graph. The velocity is changing at a constant rate. So we should be able to analyze this line with y equals mx plus b. If we do that, well, let's imagine what y would be. y would be the final velocity at some time. The slope is always found by taking change in y value over change in x value. So for this interval here, uh, we, we would be, for this graph, really, we would be taking change in velocity over change in time. We see right here that the definition of acceleration uh, shows up in our slope of the velocity versus time graph. So we are convinced now that the slope of a velocity versus time graph does give acceleration. My x value is t, and then my y-intercept over here is the initial velocity. Well, like I said previously, this is the definition of acceleration right here. And so we've proved the formula that we thought was the case up here. You can also show that the displacement can be found from looking at the area beneath the line on our velocity versus time graph. And you can see that. if we break this down and look at a couple different areas. So what we're going to ask ourselves here is, uh, is it true that the displacement is equal to the, uh, the area here? Is that true? Where the area, by the way, will be the area of a rectangle, which we will show here. plus the area of the triangle. This guy right up here. So let's have that. The area of the rectangle would be found by taking base times height. So in this case, t times v naught. The area of the triangle we would find by taking one half base times height, so in this case one half t. The height will be vf minus v naught. If we break this down a little bit, we'll be able to see that we have, I'm just going to rearrange this slightly, so we will have v naught t plus one half vf t minus one half b naught t. That will get us down to Well, I'm not convinced yet that that's equal to delta x. You might be, but let's show it more explicitly. If I rearrange this part just a little bit, then we can see that we get this. 
And we did convince ourselves earlier that this is equal to the average velocity. And so we have now shown that it is true that the area is equal uh, to the displacement here. We do know this to be true. So it is true that the area beneath the line on a velocity versus time graph does give displacement. Now let's continue along and what we're going to do here is we're going to derive a couple more kinematic equations from things that you are already convinced of. So we have the following, we have the definition for acceleration up here, we have uh, displacement equals average velocity times time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine these two equations and I'm going to do so in a way that eliminates time. I'm going to get rid of that t variable and I'm going to do that by multiplying these two equations together, left and right side. So I'll start over here. Acceleration times displacement should be equal to the product of the right hand sides here. So we have Bf minus B0 over T. And this term over here. You can see that the T's will cancel, and that I will be left with and then a one-half term. So this is just a, uh, you know, foil this out here. And rearrange to show you what it'll look like in most physics textbooks. And here's the second of our kinematic equations right here. A box-worthy result, if I do say so myself. Moving on and deriving our third kinematic equation, we're going to do that um, with things that we've already seen before. I mean, these, these are the same two equations that we just dealt with. Uh, but we're going to rearrange them differently. In this case, we're going to eliminate final velocity. Uh, we will do that by substituting in for this final velocity the result that we have right over here. We'll just take this and plug it right in over there. And when we do that, we will have uh, the following result. So this delta x right here will be equal to and my one half term. By distributing the t here, we will see and this is our third kinematic equation, another box-worthy result. All in all, we will be using these three kinematic equations uh, to describe the motion of objects moving in one dimension. Now, we'll actually use them as we describe the motion of objects moving in two dimensions. And